Let me start by uh, welcoming everyone to this second lecture. And it is said the second meeting is usually the more uh, convivial one. And, and today I thought uh, we should focus on uh, uh, how we could represent diasporas as incompleteness in motion. Uh, as you, you will have seen in the abstract, in this lecture I argue that the meaning we accord the notion of diaspora informs our understanding of diasporic writing, literature, and articulations of belonging. I explore diaspora through a framework that brings into a sustained, multi-dimensional and multi-layered conversation the universality of incompleteness in motion. And motion, sorry. The lecture draws on African experience of, uh, to offer a nuanced framework for analyzing diasporic cultural production and articulation of belonging because it challenges the overly nation state centric conceptualization of the homeland. It demonstrates that such a confining conceptualization sits uncomfortably with the lived realities of those with multi-layered identities and belongings mediated by interconnecting geographies and hierarchies within and beyond states at local and global levels. The discussion wrestles the conception of diaspora from its long-standing fixation on the whims and caprices of nation states and broadens its incompleteness in motion by arguing that in the contemporary world, there are as many diasporas as there are homes and dislocations. Thus, events such as the ongoing wars and liberation struggles within and between nation states have proven that one person's hometown is simultaneously another person's diaspora and one person's home village is concomitantly another's diaspora, respectively. The, the discussion cautions writers and analysts of diasporic literature and cultural production more broadly to constantly remember that within, beyond, and outside the nation state, frontier homes and frontier diasporas sit side by side, complementing each other and facilitating interconnection and interchanges in the manner of a spaghetti, spaghetti junction. I may not have dwelled on it in the red version of my first uh, Jensen lecture last week, but in the written version, I, I delve into detail how my idea of incompleteness is inspired and richly illustrated by the writings of the late Nigerian writer Amos Tutuola, the author of The Palm Wine Drinker, which was published in 1952, and uh, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts, uh, published 1954 by the renowned Faber and Faber that are Bay London based. His writings help us to understand the making, unmaking, and the remaking of belonging through motion, a perspective that is best seen in historical process. For Tutuola, incompleteness is not a condition to shy away from, or to be guilty of, or to feel that you need to work hard to complete it, but rather just something to recognize and embrace, and then to seek to activate productively through mobility, encounters, and relationships with other people and environments. Although we live in a world where, strictly speaking and empirically speaking, incompleteness and mobility are regular and universal, we have been cultivated and schooled in the sustained pursuit of completeness through a stubborn and violent ambition to dominate and enshrine exclusionary games of belonging. Our zero-sum pretensions 
to being and belonging drive us to use hierarchies of ever-shifting categories such as race, ethnicity, culture, place, class, gender, sexuality, and age to imagine, impose, and police borders between insiders and outsiders, us and them, home and away, the civilized and the profane, and uh, uh, with implications that one, one can ill afford to take one's humanity for granted. Due to such winner-takes-all ambitions of dominance or quest for supremacy, we create, contest, and recreate the boundaries of visibility, prominence, and privilege through our capacity to define and confine in tune with the whims and caprices that animate us. In our mobility, we name and rename the unfamiliar to render them familiar, even when we may, in instances of unequal encounters, uh, uh, fueled by zero-sum ambitions of conquest, lack the power to enforce the names we give what we encounter. Imperialism, colonialism, and global consumer cap capitalism are good cases in point of hi hierarchicized mobilities resulting in unequal encounters and unequal access to power. If domination is the name of the game that we play, then we cannot afford to have an unregulated inclusivity. It is our interest, it is in our interest to thrive on distinctions and to invest uh, the, uh, to invent these where, wherever necessary. If our game is, is domination, then if we don't find distinctions, we invent them in order to ensure uh, uh, that we can we continue to dominate those we encounter. It is in our interest to thrive on distinctions and to invent these where necessary. A critical examination of the notion of diaspora and how it has been used over time tells the story of a term that begs for distinction. Distinctions and boundedness that are empirically absent or not that prominent in the lives of those categorized as the diaspora. The framework we use to appreciate diasporas does not take interconnections and interdependencies as the norm. It is a framework in which flexible mobility is an exception and cultures and identities are presented as bounded and essentialized properties of particular peoples and homelands. The framework treats the inescapability of cultural hybridity with deceptive suspicion, uh, disdain or trivialization. Its prescriptiveness does not authorize the hybrid to negotiate conviviality between marginality or minoritization and majoritarian sovereignty, or to cre creatively reconcile enunciation, enunciation and renunciation. It imbues with guilt ambivalence and feelings of, of, of being in an identity crisis or cultural limbo, anyone remotely inclined to straddling identity margins, uh, claiming multiple belongings and championing incompleteness and conviviality in the manner of V.S. Naipaul's Half and Half, and Half, a novel by V.S. Naipaul that I believe you may have uh, encountered. The latter are hybrids who are not credited with more than half a life, regardless of their personal desires and experiences at building bridges across the sociocultural or political, uh, so sociocultural politics of chasms. Those caught betwixt and between the rigid native settler, insider, outsider, autochthon, stranger oppositions are in their structural powerlessness as minorities defined and confined almost permanently to an invisible ephemeral presence regardless of their actual achievements in the land and currency of the sovereign host. When cultures and peoples leave or travel from their des designated homelands, they are expected to reconstitute themselves into a community in exile and to be 
eternally nostalgic about their homeland of origin. Such expectations take attention away from forging alternative solidarities in which diasporic communities are open and accommodating to connecting strongly with one another based solely of the fact of being, of both being a diaspora, no matter how different their per uh, perceived homelands. This aspect is inadequately explored in light of the resilient expectations that bounded identities are the norm. Yet, as I argue in this presentation, such a rigid view of diaspora is far from an empirically informed depiction of the reality of incompleteness, flexible mobility, encounters, and compositeness of being and becoming who and what one is through relationships within one's familiar circles, place and spaces, and with strangers home and away. In the written version of this lecture, which I've given to Susan to circulate as she sees uh, uh, fit, uh, I give an example from a personal account of, our, uh, of an ever-evolving sense of home and belonging by Kojo Annan uh, paying tribute to his late father, the former Secretary General of the uh, UN, uh, Kofi Annan, as an example of various facets of incompleteness in motion. Let's listen to him. Quality of the video is not so good, but you can hear the sound. Oh, Madam President, Mr. Secretary General, <clears throat> Excellencies, Friends, it's an incredible honor to stand here in this awe inspiring room in front of this august assembly <clears throat> to pay tribute to my father. This is hallowed ground. It's the only place on the planet where the entire world comes together to address mankind's biggest challenges and harness our greatest opportunities. And this is hallowed ground because, in a lot of ways, it is home. The UN was home to my father for the better part of 45 years and has always felt like home to be in my family. What is home anyway? I've been reflecting on that question a lot lately. What is home? Who am I? Where am I from? And where am I going? A father's death has a distinct effect of prompting uncomfortable existential questions. I was born in Geneva to a Ghanaian father and a Nigerian mother. I am also a British citizen and have lived many years of my life in London, Lagos, Accra, and New York. My sister Anna is a US citizen who has lived in New York, Lagos, Paris, and London. My stepmother, Anna, Daddy's beloved wife for the past 35 years is Swedish. My sister Nina is Swedish and now recently Swiss. <laughs> Nina's lovely kid is Swedish, Dutch, and Swiss. Don't ask me how the world comes out in their house. <laughs> My wife is quarter Nigerian, quarter Ghanaian, quarter Indian, Indian, and a quarter English. It's a mini UN. As a result, I've always thought of myself as a global citizen. But recently, as I reflected on my father's remarkable life, it struck me that being a global citizen has nothing to do with the stamps on your passport, or the addresses you live at, or your own world miles about. It's a responsibility far greater than the trappings of privilege that my father's career afforded me. I finally understand that being a global citizen is about completely embracing the common humanity of all the world's citizens. Perfect. It's about... In, in the written version, I, I, tra I transcribed the whole speech. So what you miss by my stopping it midway, uh, you'll get from the written version. If uh, Kojo Annan's story sounds utopian, it is because we have a tendency to define and appreciate home and belonging 
rather rigidly and administratively, as if completeness were anything but transient or illusory. His story highlights an idea of home as a lived and felt reality resulting from the changing compositeness and conviviality forged by everyday negotiations and choices attributed to mobilities and encounters because of incompleteness. It challenges us to rethink what we understand and attribute to belonging in an interconnected and interconnecting world in motion. The currency of exclusivity in, belong, in belonging uh, configured around and sustained by the nation state is challenged by stories such as Kojo Annan's to rethinking the terminology of home and diaspora by reinsert, reinserting both in motion. If we think people's belonging is based on the home uh, nation state relationship as a fixity, home becomes exclusionary shaped by and shaping a logic of ever diminishing circles of inclusion. Such exclusionary uh, de uh, degenerates or generates and is fueled by other logics such as racism, xenophobia, and populist nationalism. By accepting incompleteness, compositeness, and mobility as a nature of things, the inclusivity in, pro in progress suggested by Kojo Annan's experience of home can be fostered, not as utopian, but as retrieving and acknowledging the incompleteness in motion that makes us who we are through relationships and encounters. Kojo Anna's story is thus an invitation for us to disabuse ourselves of territorially, culturally, and administratively defining and confining illusions of completeness. It is a call to embrace a global citizenship informed by flexible mobility, an idea of home as a permanent work in progress. Each and every one of us, frequent flyer or not, accorded the authority to tell the story of interconnections activated by their own incompleteness in motion would have their own personal account to share, accounts that do not necessarily reflect the standardized, routinized, uh, predictable, bureaucratized versions imagined, practiced, and reproduced by states and kindred institutions. If incompleteness and mobility make belonging through encounters a permanent work in progress, I suggest then that we seek to understand diaspora as incompleteness in motion. This is not to deny or trivialize the ascriptive credentials of cultural and political identities into which we are born and raised, but to make a case of, for the negotiation and choices that come with the mobilities and encounters. So let's briefly examine what actually, uh, uh, how diasporas in, in, uh, as incompleteness in motion uh, uh, form. The use of the term diaspora has come a long way from its limited usage to include the diasporas of various origins. However, the concept could be stretched to be even more inclusive. There is a tendency also for the diaspora to be confined to those who have been dispersed beyond nation states, native to them as homelands, as if the nation state is the only unit of dispersal. And that's what I question in this lecture. It is as if before the invention of the nation state, homelands or dispersers were not possible. Yet archeology span and deep history will tell us that the modern world is a product of dispersers that date all the way back to the continent of, the, of Africa as the cradle of humankind. And when anthropologists write of people away from home through dislocations of various kinds, home refers much more to the home regions, hometowns, and home villages to which the diasporas feel primary loyalty and patriotism than to the nation state, which may or may not be, uh, 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 which they may or may not be loyal to or patriotic about. These home places of primary patriotism are 
prioritized as places where community members in the diaspora, abroad in the, in the, in the city, or who live as ethnic strangers elsewhere, desire or insist to be buried uh, uh, when, when they pass on. If cultures exist not as natural or biological essences or as bounded entities, but as dynamic realities that are socially, politically, and historically produced, then cultural identities or communities are, as Benedict Anderson has so well articulated, imagined realities, not in the sense of being fabricated or false, but in that they are pro products of human imagination, creativity, and the power to render them visible and collective. The members of the imagined community need not be know one another to, to be able to belong together, but, they, uh, ev but every imagined community needs to work hard to keep together as identities are always contested and subject to renegotiation with changing configurations informed by internal and external hierarchies of interconnections. Identities as imagined communities tend to privilege the logic of exclusion over that of inclus inclusion, such that the circles of belonging are paradoxically forever diminishing uh, the more we scrutinize them. Hence, however magnanimous, benevolent, or inclusive uh, are imagined as limited sovereign communities uh, for which those elected for, for inclusion must display gratitude through consciousness patriotism and readiness to sacrifice in honor of the nation. Nation states and national identities are produced through the active investment in seeking congruence in polity and culture. In an African context where nation states in their current configuration are largely along the lines, the contested lines of the continent's subjection to European colonialism, one is likely to encounter articulations of identities and belongings in terms of ethnic communities that are characterized not only by shared cultures, solidarities, and consciousness, but also by shared geographies. In the case of a resident colony as South Africa that was under European colonialism, the added dimension of apartheid led to the creation of Bantu stands uh, that served mainly as labor reserves and provided the rationalization for racialized hierarchies of humanity. European colonial authorities imposed the concept of illegal migration in order to cheapen and control labor migration and segregate populations according to race and ethnicity. Colonialism discovered, discouraged the cultivation of solidarities of humanness, of humanness in favor of transactional relations of exchange, which it manipulated in favor of the colonizers and to uh, ensure that the colonized shall never be fully human. Apartheid legislation made it possible not only to distinguish between Europeans and non-Europeans, uh, or white or non-white, but also between uh, cities and rural communities Bantustans and European or white communities, tribesmen and tribeswomen, uh, and tribes, tribes, uh, tribeswomen and tribesmen, and so on and so forth, uh, uh, citizens and subjects, tribal and ethnic uh, citizens and ethnic strangers, natives and non natives. This was the case even in urban South Africa where there was a lot of mingling, intermingling, and commingling that made it possible for people to relate across otherwise rigid racial and ethnic bound, uh, boundaries in networks suggestive of cosmopolitanism and uh, conviviality. The colonial and apartheid authorities made it extremely difficult for their uh, African servants and support staff to feel at home away from home. Thus, driving even the most reluctant of them to look back to the home village for solidarity and sustenance, when they would have preferred permanent integration as bona fide townsmen and townswomen. The extent to which these racialized, uh, complicated, 
uh, and the layered articulations of belonging have changed in the post-apartheid dispensation remains a subject of research. And with implications on how the notion of diaspora is understood and mobilized. Similarly, in a context where Africa as a continent and the Africans have, have been perceived and acted upon in racialized categories as blacks with a capital B and subjected to forced migration through transatlantic enslavement, for instance, to take talk of diasporas purely within the confines of the nation state as currently understood is to impoverish the African experience and its pan-African resonance. The transatlantic slave uh, trade was a major cause of the African diasporic experience in modernity and it, it was a, th a thoroughly bitter and tra traumatic one. Diaspora in this sense was created through massive human theft, wars, displacement, and relentless sequestration uh, uh, of African bodies and minds. It was an ugly, traumatic experience that deserves sustained representation by writers of African descent in conversation with one another and in a manner that injects fresh imagination on the interconnected high uh, histories and cultures of Africa in motion. The fact that in enslavement predated European colonialism on the continent and the forms of nationhood and statehood that accom accompanied it by no means erases the reality of uh, dis dispersion experienced by Africans who were dislocated and forcefully exported as slaves away from their continental homeland. In this connection, uh, Kamari Clark introduces the notion of humanitarian diasporas as a challenge to rethink transatlantic uh, slavery as the central basis for conceptualizing the starting place of African diasporic theorization in Europe and the, and, 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 and the Americas and elsewhere, as well as highlighting the transnationalism in the movement of people and things. Of interest is how uh, Clark's uh, perspective brings into conversation and the, in, re in relation to contemporary issues on the African continent, different generations of uh, African diasporas, old and new, into historical perspective and through the prism of an equal encounters between the West and the rest. As in the next and the final uh, uh, section of the lecture, I suggest thematic considerations for diasporic representation. How do we, uh, what are the sort of themes we could take into account if we are writing or filmmaking or whatever meaningfully about diasporas as incompleteness in motion. Irrespective of where we, we pitch our understanding and discussion of diaspora, whether continent, nation state, ethnic, or village level, I would like to suggest that we explore the extent to which literature from and by the various diasporas of interest to us speaks to incompleteness, mobility, and encounters. How does such literature articulate the place of borders belonging and citizenship in how humans seek to mobilize their incompleteness productively. How do diasporic writers depict when such attempts at self-activation are confronted with exclusionary logics of being and belonging as seems to be the dominant and persistent mood? What degree of complexity and nuance do they bring to the tendency of nation states to perfect and emphasize technologies of containment, detection, detention, and deportation of those perceived to circulate outside the borders of the purported homelands to which they are confined? How does autoethnography change this discussion? If and when allowed, to what extent is integration more than one-dimensional? 
where the host or insider community expects the diasporic outsider to do the adaptation by adopting wholesale the uh, prescriptions of their host. What are the possibilities for members of the host community uh, to warming up to diasporic hearts, learning to beat and feel for the sons and daughters of the native soils of their hosts? Can time play a a factor in this. To what extent is it possible for a diasporic settler to become a native in reality and in the creative imagination of those in the business of representing diasporic experiences in their writings? How articulate are representations of diasporic uh, processes that disrupt subvert and reinforce conventional understandings of being and belonging. How convincing does such literature reimagine encounters between mobile outsiders and entitled insiders in which flexible forms of belonging and citizenship are greeted with suspicion in contexts where dichotomies and differences are prioritized over interconnections and interdependencies? Put differently, how do diasporic writers grapple with the fact that not many countries are hospitable to the idea of multiple citizenships? How, in other words, do they problematize the tendency in nation states to define and confine through insisting on total allegiance to one polity, one homeland, or one ethnicity, even as culturally a person might, com might be composite and dispersed in their loyalties. Representations of the diaspora in motion ought to emphasize without relent the fact that cultures travel through people, ideas, things, beliefs, and practices. They manifest and reproduce themselves in conversation with those they encounter in their travels through food, clothing, and taste in fashion, language, forms of religiosity, ideas and practices around marriage, uh, family, life, uh, death, and more, much more. Books, films, and other cultural forms are used to produce and sustain the circulation and transmission of such cultural identities in motion. In the process of such encounters, they shape and are shaped by new cultures. In their travels, people as embodiments of cultures stay connected with the idea of a homeland through shared memories, myths, visions, rituals, and other values. In this regard, it could be argued that Due to the conception of diasporas as incompleteness in motion, cultures do not exist over and above the historical and political, cultures do not exist over and above uh, the, over and above, sorry, cultures do not exist over and above the historical and political processes that produce and reproduce them, but they can defy attempts at confining them to particular spaces and places, especially with ever more dislocation, relocation, and flexible mobility of people and mass-mediated cultural products and ideas. This understanding emphasizes the need to explore power in its unequal and its unequal relations within and between cultures as critical to understanding the meanings people make of culture and cultural difference, especially how they are produced and reproduced. Granted that not, not every member of the diaspora is proud of the homeland that they left behind, fantasies and dreams and reimagination are also important ways of uh, staying connected just as back in their homelands where individuals and communities are united by difference and ambition. The fact of being physically separated by distance from the homeland does not necessarily make 
a homogeneous community of the diaspora. Home or away, communities are as desired as they are contested. While some seek to forge new rooted and lasting links and bonds with their host communities, others are working tirelessly to regain what they believe they have lost or have been disp dispossessed of, however bleak their aspirations might be. To seek a, a return to a homeland necessitates relearning on various fronts, including, as Homi Baba uh, would put it, the languages of domicile, of domicile and domesticity as they are rerouted through the wayward and wandering vocabularies of displacement in order to understand the full import of such a return. However, the desire to return, relocate, or resettle in the homeland may not come across, uh, cut across generations. Such diasporas are not necessarily united by what is there, but some, some, diaspora, some, some diasporas are not necessarily united by what is there, but by the possibilities of bringing about much more than uh, what one has left behind. This would be the case for those who fled the homelands because of persecution or the brutality, dictatorship, or corruption of the governments and states. The theme of, of liber liberalism, human rights, and democracy would find particular traction with those seeking to repre represent or justify having fled the homelands. In the case of countries where dictatorships and poor governance have forced many an, uh, a member to seek refuge in, in foreign soils, it is sometimes the case that the governments of, of, of those homelands with which they are fleeing from uh, continues to hunt them down uh, to where they have fled. This might include infiltrating the diaspora with agent provocateurs, and spies uh, to report back to the governments or authorities of the homeland. Uh, this capacity to monitor and track down dissidents has grown in sophistication with new digital technologies of surveillance, and as says, see Jensen Lecture 3. Use of the surve uh, surveillance uh, uh, technologies to track down is not limited to government, but could also uh, be used by uh, religious movements. And uh, those technologies uh, also as harnessed by uh, uh, diaspora, uh, ordinary diaspora uh, uh, in, to, to stay in connection with the homeland uh, is, is, is a fascinating area of focus in terms of representation. And you know how uh, the, the, the harnessing of high cities, for example, uh, in various ways make it possible for diasporas uh, to be present at home, even when they are not there physically, to participate in marriages and uh, 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 various uh, rituals and, and, and so on. And uh, Henrietta, uh, uh, Nyamjo has done a lot of work in this area, uh, both in, in the Netherlands and in Cape Town, and uh, her work is available to, to point to this. Uh, a final point I would like to, 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 to draw on is, or to mention in, uh, very quickly, is a theme of growing currency in thinking and writing Africa in motion, which, is, which comes under the notion of Afropolitanism. It, it focuses on Africans caught betwixt and between cultures and geographical locations, navigating and negotiating the nuanced complexities of a world of interconnecting local and global hierarchies, with an especial refrain being African cosmopolitanism inspired by encounters with the West. Afropoli the, Af the Afropolitan writer might come across as a self-appointed spokesperson of the globally uh, dispersed, nimble-footed frontier Africans traversing multiple borders, geographic settings, uh, languages, and cultures, often with a, a startling degree of fluidity, uh, aptitude, and success. 
Yet the predicaments and possibilities they seek to direct attention to in their narratives and representations can be traced back to the genius and the humanisms of famous writers, again, as Emma Tutuola, as you will see in Jensen Lecture 4, where we use his uh, uh, Bush of Ghosts uh, uh, from the lens of a diasporic uh, experience and what it tells us about flexible citizenship. Uh, another uh, 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 that I, I reference here, and Mamadou might point you to him uh, and his work more, is uh, 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 George Collinet, uh, who has headed uh, the, uh, since 1988, a US uh, produced public radio international podcast called uh, Africa, Afri Afropop World Worldwide. So you see Af African mobility through sound through its music, and it will be um, an amazing uh, archive for us to draw on to see how to represent Africa uh, uh, in its nimble-footedness of sound. Uh, I would like to conclude with my countryman, uh, Manu Dibango, who uh, inspired the, this idea of, of, of uh, uh, Afropolitanism. And we often forget when, acad when uh, 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 academics uh, borrow from musicians and other artists and they don't duly acknowledge, like I have the habit of doing, but here I'm acknowledging him. So, uh, Manu Divango, before he passed on, uh, on, on March 2014, uh, 2022, March 24, 2022, from COVID, he was based in Paris. And uh, he died at the age of 86. But uh, he's well known for his book, uh, which he called, uh, 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 which his autobiography was called, uh, uh, he, he coined the word uh, uh, Negropolitan uh, in, in that biography. It's called Three Kilos of Coffee. And Negropolitan was how he described himself. And by that, he simply meant using the French word Negro, which means uh, uh, Afropolitan, really. Uh, that, so when, when we got it in the academy, we, we didn't invent it. It came from him. Uh, and in it, he said that uh, he and his music could not be confined to Africa, nor wholly outsourced to Europe, where he was based, without it being impoverished. So he said that. Uh, 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 he was an African and a European at one and the same time. And his idea of Afropolitan can only best be understood and accepted when we insert it into, in, in, the, in the framework of incompleteness and motion. And, and, and uh, uh, he, he, uh, he, he leaves us with a lot to contemplate. And his wife, uh, who was Belgian, <laughs> similar to uh, uh, Kojo uh, and his multiple belongings, uh, said that somehow uh, Manu Dibango was more useful to Africa, away from Africa, even as his inspiration came from Africa. But what it simply means is that uh, 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 if you stay frozen in your incompleteness, if your incompleteness is not activated by mobility, you actually diminish and you wither, wither away. So there's, there's, there's impo it, it is important in activating uh, our uh, being African or being anything through motion. Uh, incompleteness offers you the basic uh, uh, elements to, to test yourself to the limit through activation and self-extension. So I conclude by saying, if the current popularity with African Americans of technologies of tracing the African origins and uh, ethno ancestry by DNA is anything to judge by, it could be argued that there is much more potential in the notion of Afro Afropolitanism than simply limiting it to the cosmopolitan pretensions of the newer generation of African diasporas from nation states as a colonial creation. The notion could be brought 
much more into conversation with how Africans as victims and descendants of enslavement in the West and in other parts of the world have sought to reconnect with and celebrate their Africanity as diasporic Africans whose citizenship and belonging are currently experienced in nation states where their forebears were forcibly export, transported, dehumanized, and rendered into things. Similarly, as Amos Tutuola's The Palm Wine Drinker, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts, and his other writings would show, again see Jensen Lecture 4, there is no reason why the notion of Afropolitanism and being Afropolitan could not be used to explore endogenous dispersals and interconnections within the continent for a sense of African cosmopolitanism and being African that is not necessarily filtered or mediated by encounters with the West. I conclude with a question which is, to what extent does what I have discussed provide a useful framework for analyzing diasporic uh, literatures with which you are familiar? If you don't have time to answer the question, uh, ask, uh, ask uh, Chad GPT <laughs> to write a 4,000 word essay for you in 30 seconds. It will do that. Thank you very much. Thank you.